questions also, uh, if you could fill out the uh, little flyer or the, what is it, the survey, yeah. If you can get that done, that would be great. I would really appreciate feedback on this. So if everyone's all settled, I'll get started. My name is Sarah Bonzer, and I'll be talking with you today about world building with architecture. And more specifically, designing for an authentic experience. And I know that sounds a lot like some words you're familiar with, but authentic specifically relates to how feelings are generated. There's a way to get to engaging, immersive, unique, etc., without encompassing this trait specifically. For something to be perceived and remembered as authentic, it can't feel manufactured. Authenticity is best achieved below the level of consciousness. Architecture is actually fantastic at this because it requires no acknowledgement for it to have an impact. Bernard Schumi famously notes, architecture cannot satisfy your wildest fantasies, but it may exceed the limits set by them. I'd imagine the opportunity to capture an audience on it's got great architecture is exceptionally rare, but the capacity to make a game unforgettable with the help of architecture appears to be unbounded by genre. Architecture has the capacity to affect occupants, whether it's behaviorally uh, portraying a sense of space or providing a lens through which to perceive information. Levels work in a similar way, organically teaching strategy, providing a backdrop for lore, and divulging plot. And admittedly, this is a lot to cover in an hour. So here's a quick rundown. I'm gonna catch everyone up on relevant architectural theory. Then we'll look at how it's applied to video games as well as some built structures. After getting the hang of it, we'll go in depth into three well-known games as case studies. I'll close out with some sources to learn more. A little bit about me. I'm an artist and a licensed architect in the state of Washington. I got some degrees from the Ohio State University and work as a project architect now. And actually, there's a very rigorous process to getting a license. It's about 5,600 hours of, of apprenticeship, seven tests, six years of school, and a state-mandated 1,000 hours of The Sims? No, that's not right. Uh, <laughs> Notably, theory is actually baked into our professional um, profession through education, whether we use it day to day or not. We need it so that we can explain to any client or consultant that we're working with, whether they know architectural theory or not. Because it's good design is not actually a viable defense for an idea. This knowledge is the way to keep our concept intact as, con as constraints get layered on. So that makes buildings like this look really impressive. And as I'd mentioned before, architecture works without the occupant's acknowledgement, acknowledgement. And I wanted to find how that works precisely. There are a ton of little indicators, scale of material, types of openings, striation of level and lighting. Each of those little indicators informs a viewer why, when, where, what, and who built this thing. Even the context provides a lot of information. So we see in this one, it's actually manufactured materials that clad it. That was built in a factory and had to get shipped to site and had to get told to the people that are installing it exactly where those go. That's not a brick. That's not something that you just lay on in a, in a certain order. That's not something that one person is trained to uh, do over many buildings that's specific to that single building. So that tells you a lot about the intent of what it's trying to convey and a lot of things about what kind of strategies were employed to create the building. These indicators allow a layperson to pick up on characteristics of a building. For instance, some buildings just look evil. Shout out to our evil buildings for some of these ones. Spikes, evil. So going into space forever, evil. Some angles, probably evil. Without knowing anything else about it, a first impression actually goes a long way to evoke feelings. Cerulio figured this out and codified it with these two illustrations of comedic and tragic scenes. These sets demonstrate a series of indicators which set the context for how characters are feeling. Take a moment to compare the two. We'll start by looking at the tragic scene. The tragic scene has a ton of gravity as the space keeps going back into that set. The buildings fall in line and stand at attention, enforcing center framing. Cornices loom over the street and decorations are carved in stone. Then we compare this to the comedic scene. 
where the buildings are individually expressive. The massing does not appear to have been coordinated overall. Individuality is expressed through decoration and articulation of colonnades. We see a wider variety of architectural styles, and these propose a more casual feel to the setting, as they're far less subjected to rules and overarching organization. So let's look at these again, and note the ways they're leaning on the set to use that opportunity to show and not tell. Unlike relying solely on dialogue for storytelling, where you must select a reading level that you're catering to, environments have the unique opportunity of displaying layered information to players, freeing designers from catering solely to the largest demographic. So let's just take a moment to look at how layer levels have been used in the past. We'll start with the extrusion of the ground floor and how that's clad in, in indicative textures. So these are strictly informative. They tell you where the bounds of your playable area are. From there, we got these graphically excellent illustrations of architecture, but not necessarily functioning beyond something like a set. Shortly after, we see architecture being used to fill in narrative gaps for players. It can be also used to indicate advantageous strategies for upcoming obstacles. Since then, we've seen many sophisticated combat games leverage level design for strategic purposes. But what's even more interesting to me is something that's on the cusp of my own reach as an architect, empathy. This is a fascinating direction for games to move because it can make the problems of others seem familiar and relatable. Specifically, creating an emotional impact on an adult audience requires authenticity. I see an unparalleled potential for this medium as it has evolved to this in just two short decades. Architectural theory has some ability to help clarify opportunities to impact spaces and how that can affect occupants. Writing topics can also serve as a guide toward a more critical dialogue for game designers. We'll start by looking design in the most utilitarian application, introducing a player to a game. Tutorials can be the most immersion-breaking moment in a game. The character and the player are at opposite ends of the spectrum. Presumably, the character has been running and jumping for years, but the player is being asked to do this for the very first time. Having control over the environment means supplying information to the player intentionally. Put simply, overt design requires the player to gather information. Subversive design gives the player information. Overt design calls for the audience to draw information about complex subjects. You can use it to convey history, social norms, and political climate from surrounding atmosphere, similar to the way you learn about a city's culture by traveling there. The urban fabric is heavily influenced by the culture of an area. Most people can recognize the plan of Paris because this bizarro thing happened. This guy Hausman came in with this plan to get some avenues in there, and it took about 75 years to carry out. So that threw it into this way different trajectory than any other city, giving it a sense of place. Subversive design conveys information passively, like designing a push and pull side for a door handle, which looks visually different, or tactile transition surfaces for pedestrians going into a vehicular area. In louder ways, it can direct you to take the stairs instead of an elevator. Without being tied to a single language, we can universally convey a lot of information. One concept which architects grapple with is this idea of consciousness. Phenomenology is a word that I'll try not to bank on, but it breaks down to something that adds to ambiance. It registers as a coincidence or a phenomenon and creates an experience below the level of acknowledgement by the occupant. Plot should register above consciousness as the player needs to have an understanding of why they're providing actions towards a role and foreshadowing as a tool becomes available once that context is understood. Doom 2 actually uses both very skillfully as information is baked into the game environment, providing lore and strategic information to the player. It trains the player over a series of levels to navigate the halls of hell more adeptly. Your character is a paranoid space marine armed with a pistol methodically working his way through a demon stronghold. This environment uses lines and lights to direct you through the level. Soon you'll find yourself pressing up against walls, frantically searching for more supplies. 
Doom leverages overt cues to teach the player where to look for supplies using gargoyles and grotesqueries. Later levels appear to have a ritualistic or religious aesthetic to them. Items decorating scenes have a strong hierarchical and symmetrical design sensibility. These indicators prime the player to imagine answers to questions they have about the environment. When monsters spawn or you get dropped into a pit, it can be attributed to any of the various reasons your brain came up with. This leverages the player's imagination to come up with more convincing reasons than you as a designer could possibly predict for them. Portal and its sequel also rely on gameplay with gradually increasing complexity. According to Chris Chin at Valve, the first few puzzles scale from one solution to multiple as the player gains more agency over the character. Using colored light and iconography, the players will gravitate towards certain areas predictably. The grid also provides this burdensome backdrop for the test chambers. And those grid lines you see really tap into this idea of modular furniture being primarily consumed as oppressive. Modular materials are classically used in large spaces with no particular interest in hospitality and notably do not tap into fond memories. DMVs are riddled with these materials, for instance. These inherent thought processes allow Portal to snap the player into the character's mindset of escape. As a result, Gladys and Wheatley dialogue doesn't have to tell you how to feel or what to do. This results in an organic and authentic experience for the player, given the opportunity to graft their own thoughts onto the canvas as well. Destiny 2 is interesting because the multiplayer maps, of course, don't tell you how to navigate and where advantageous locations are but sight lines and organic movement still happen. And it brings the fights around the mountain. So focused scrimmage areas migrate as sniping locations perform as a catalyst. While the game is technically and graphically excellent, the campaign doesn't leverage the layout of the environment in the same way. It doesn't provide any inherent wayfinding. This is only evident as a bar because the Crucible maps are so good at this. In the opening mission, Homecoming, it relies on, heavily on voiceovers and HUD. As a result of this, your ghost and vanguards forego some opportunities to directly characterize themselves. They actively direct your player through the map. This undermines the immersive feel of agency. As a result, the storyline must keep raising the stakes in order to continue to have an impact on the player. To some extent, as a designer, you must reward your player for pouring their own thoughts into their experience. If you set a standard that ceilings are rewarding and worthwhile to look at, you'll train your player to use that information actively. If you mail it in, you're likely to lose a little bit of trust with the player. It's kind of like sig figs. How do architects build these expectations? We'll go through a quick study noting specific elements of their impacts. And for the sake of this talk, architecture can be described through its materiality, adjacency, figure, light, and scale. More complex ideas, such as proportion and ratio, can be extrapolated from scale, for instance. Zaha Hadid uses the Contemporary Arts Center in Cincinnati to make art accessible. She uses a variety of tactics to achieve that accessibility, tackling it from different directions. So we'll take a moment to get acquainted with Hadid's masterpiece. Hadid ushers in the public by continuing this concrete from the sidewalk up the building in the wall. The gesture allows the concrete to characterize itself through texture. It's scored and rough at the sidewalk and honed in the lobby. And it has this formwork texture as it turns up into the wall as a structural material. The massing of the building relies on sliding boxes indicating function. She shows how exhibition spaces are laid out via the facade. Direct sunlight isn't good for art, therefore the space will be devoid of functional windows. This indicates individual collections and creates a hierarchy for their understanding and relationships. Natural light indicates public space. It's completely glazed and not just punched openings. The vertical scale of the public space also allows for natural light to reach deep into the structure. And I'll have you note that the entire wall is that window. It's a curtain wall. And it goes up that chasm that is the stairwell that you'll see here. 
The exaggerating light, exaggerated lighting contrasts the public space from the exhibit areas, which cannot be naturally lit. This provides a subversive cue for the occupant to speak quietly or move slowly in gallery spaces, while still providing a visual relationship to that vertical circulation. So there's a lot of moving pieces in this one, and they all work to make art seem more accessible. Hadid pursues motive from a variety of angles and uses multiple design tools. This adds to the impact and legibility, but also takes on an opportunity for improvement for future architects to use it as inspiration. We'll analyze three games, two AAA titles, and one of them is indie, but pretty well known. I chose popular games for the case studies such that most of the audience will be familiar with the story and the lore. These games hold architecture accountable for different aspects of world building, and I'll break down the opportunities they chose to take as well as a few they might have missed. Breath of the Wild uses architecture to communicate cultural values and history. Fallout 3 uses it to cohesively tell a non-linear story. Inside uses it in lieu of dialogue and text to tell a story. FYI, there will be spoilers. I'll start with Breath of the Wild. My favorite part of this game was seeing the villages. They establish Link as a visitor, which adds to the authenticity. The lore has been built up by preceding Legend of Zelda games, but designers don't rely on that alone. Each village requires Link to earn an augment to reach or move through the area, creating a destination as opposed to something you just stumble upon, which overall is a very successful strategy for an open world game. In fact, the open nature of this world has created an emphasis on profile as a defining navigational feature. For instance, the stables look like horses. If you see them from a distance, you can tell you need to put your horse there. You're drawn to its profile, which actually exists in real life architecture, but it's not nearly as effective. Architecture parlant, or speaking architecture, visually describes its own function. Modern parlant has become synonymous with these literal recreations of profile. It's an attention-hungry move. And the worst part about it is that they're just boxes on the inside. That's just like a concrete sculpture that's been put over a box. It's gross. But Breath of the Wild commits to it, which allows the player to get a little bit more information out of the skyline. It's composed of shapes and, that are already recognizable that can provide a meaning to things before you have to learn about them. This gives the player agency allowing inherent recognition skills to pay off. It's also used as a primary design feature for the divine beasts. They have a cohesive model with the interior adhering to the exterior envelope, and that makes it way better. Actually, it creates this great exquisite corpse because you can even rotate the parts around. So we'll focus on the Rito village, which is elevated by a nearby landscape. The divine beast is perched at the top of the spire, just like a bird, and the air drafts in the area pick up, similar to turbulence around real mountains. The village is lightweight wood frame construction. Fabric is a cladding material, which is uniquely advantaged in virtual architecture, and Ritos, like birds, uh, can fly, so wind direction is important to them. So feathers and fabric could feasibly serve a purpose. This allows visual correlation also to fuselages and gliders. And it's great considering how that contrasts the Goron's heavy timber construction. And actually, this is something we use in real life. A heavy timber is actually uh, fire resistant. It creates a char around the outside, uh, which prevents it from burning down as easily as lightweight wood frame construction. So it works twofold as the Gorons actually have very large hands and would most likely not care to articulate their handrails with fine details. So there's a lot of ways the level characterizes itself, but it also manages to foreshadow events as well. Just like movies, the level designers and environment artists decorated these scenes with props. It's exceptionally impressive that these work after giving the camera controls to a player. The profile of the hut is bell-shaped and framed out of wood which ends up looking like a birdcage, but it also matches the profile of that shrine more closely than any of the other buildings. This introduces the concept as what we call a dialectic, providing two ends of the spectrum, embedded stone versus elevated wood frame. And the concept of primitive hut is taught this way by two warring concepts, 
Perrault and Logier on opposite ends of the spectrum. Perrault proposes that architecture started with a hut embedded in the earth. We consider this vernacular architecture or architecture without, without architects. Logier proposes that it happened the first time uh, columns and entablature were used. But if this was the case, I don't know if that's happened yet. I haven't seen trees do that. Introducing both allows that profile to work in two ways and allows the player to fill in gaps, allowing some indication of the origin of that design. And as with every great accomplishment, there's always some way to evolve or improve the concept. So I'd say the next step would be to create slightly more varied typologies from the exterior. Providing exterior variety to the huts could allow more characterization and create a spectrum of viable Rito style huts. They're not distinctive from the exterior, which is odd as they're not intended to be manufactured. Precise, perhaps, but the organic nature of the layout would also indicate that it's not the intended takeaway. Shops and interactive huts require you to pass through the threshold to distinguish function. This problem is, of course, alleviated by showing certain items for sale or these little chick hammocks, which are kind of cute. Um, they use colored textiles as well to customize the interior. So as I'd mentioned before, Breath of the Wild does an excellent job introducing a variety of cultures. It provides comparable design moments to demonstrate nuanced information that can be distinguished between different villages as well. Moving on to Fallout 3, it was an ambitious reboot to an isometric series. It, or it introduces concrete visualizations to an already established world, which is hard. The series is laden with lore and subplots, which allow an experience to become more or less catered to each player. The landmark buildings are where the level designers chose to convey more abstract goals. So that's what I'm gonna be using as a specific cr critique. And not meant to neg negativity, but there are a lot of reasonable decisions that I believe led to a less than impactful location, Ten Penny Tower. I think there's a lot we can learn from this though. So I'll start with the datum of expectation. Megaton had a lot of roles in this game. Primarily, it establishes that datum. It uses materials and layout to convey a concept of makeshift space planning. They also established the distinction between friendly and hostile settlements by walling the city off. Circular walled cities historically have indicated a culturally important epicenter, which is true in Megaton. Everything has a view of that bomb centrally located in the city. It showcases constraints of new cities, lacking means to fabricate and time to design and construct. This contributes to the characterization of the industrious wastelanders. They're settling and developing not only single structures, but manage to create a somewhat cohesive city from scraps. So we see a fuselage from a plane underperforming as its previous life was uh, flying through the air, now it's just uh, simply a settlement. So there are a lot of things that indicate to us that this is a fallen from what it previously manufactured civilization, which is very interesting and very quick to get that information to the player. Rivet City creates a uniquely restrictive environment. The city is hosted on a retired aircraft carrier, which is a highly engineered vessel with precise openings. Unlike Megaton, these parts were not scrapped and customized. As a result, the citizens keep the structured lifestyle and it feels restrictive, even to the extent that you must get permission to access it via the drawbridge. The mall leveraged inspiration from existing architecture very well here. Even if you haven't been to the United States Capitol, you know what it looks like, it's iconic. And even if you haven't seen it, the style of architecture is so formulaic, it's enough to demonstrate what's missing based on what remains. The practicality of imposing asymmetrical damage to a one symmetrical building has an apparent impact on the player. So given all that information, let's take a look at Tenpenny Tower. It's approached somewhat early in the game. You get the marker for it after exploring only one city prior to this. It holds the quest, which presents the first massive moral decision you must make with your character. And spoiler alert, your position to arm that bomb in Megaton City and destroy it. Breadcrumbs prepare you for this though. Learning how to arm the bomb, confirming the quest, bartering for the reward, and it will land you some seriously bad karma if you go through with it. Tenpenny Tower is where you push that button. This tower is also one of the best preserved 
buildings in the fallout world, for a while at least, which creates an opportunity to represent what life was like in higher fidelity than any other exterior environment. It also has the opportunity to justify its longevity with building materials. And it may seem nitpicky, but all the rooms have, kind of look like tunnels. They lack windows. And for the tallest building in the wasteland, I would think that this would be kind of a, a selling point. But again, that's probably just because of uh, engine limitations. And without a lot of sleuthing, we can look, that, look at the New Willard Hotel and see the similarities. It's a historically tall building in Washington, D.C., and it's not a tower, though. And that's why I think Tenpenny looks a little bit squat. Early skyscrapers typically use primarily vertically, vertical articulation. Architects were actually over the moon about how high they could build, and as a result, couldn't even. About 100 years later, architects finally got over themselves and started exploring horizontal articulation. You can see the spandrel panels and floor plates articulating the iconic lever house, and the aqua tower provides modulation in the x-axis at the cost of practicality, because now it is actually just a radiator. The New Willard Hotel is actually a block building, which is why it's got that horizontal banding. Also, the hotel is massive compared to its neighbors. The city probably had restrictions on how tall a building could be on that plot of land. It's a very courteous building, though, because it gives back a little bit of space on that intersection, as you can see that chamfered corner. But then it does this thing that I have actually done myself. I feel really bad about this. Um, that cornice, that balcony, actually just shields the, the view for the pedestrian, so it looks like the building's about 40 feet shorter. I've had to do this. I don't feel great about it. The vaulted roof structure also foregoes that upper edge. So it's hiding its penthouse floor as it's timidly approaching its footprint. So when we see Tenpenny Tower mimic these things, it appears ashamed of its size, fighting to appear shorter. We also don't see anything that could pick another side of Tenpenny outside of his dialogue. Something like strong 90 degree corners could imply a rigid, unchanging nature as he's greeted with the wasteland but refuses to adapt. Also, I'm still bummed about that Windows thing. Choosing reference material requires some insight on why it's working in its current context. In fact, if you, you end up inheriting a lot of solutions to other people's problems. I could imagine a seemingly valid argument for this design as it relies on maybe existing in the palette of the Potomac. It's an existing building in the area. That would make sense. But it's easier to defend discrete moves and motives by referencing symbolic justification. This allows for more correct answers to your problem, as opposed to putting collaborators in a take it or leave it situation as well. I also saw this alternate concept art. I don't know why this didn't make it in. I could probably think of a thousand reasons why it couldn't make it in. But it does adhere better architecturally. So it has those 90 degree corners, which are really strong. It also has a bunch of different architectural styles, which is indicative of a single payer. And it does this wedding cake thing, where it builds slowly up to that decision point. And that could have a good correlation to the way you follow those breadcrumbs. Fallout ultimately does a fantastic job with storytelling. I spent 300 hours in this game, and I didn't feel constrained by an order of levels. So no matter what path I took, each did their part to further illustrate the world and the culture of the Wastelanders. Now, Inside was a remarkable game, and I will warn you, spoilers on this one. I'm saying that because it is a really good reveal. But the game relies on context and gameplay to reveal the plot. There are a lot of clever decisions which capitalize on the constraints and requirements. These decisions are leveraged to challenge the player to solve this meta puzzle, introducing a desire to know why you're here and what you're doing. Playdead uses this set to uh, this to set up and train the player under a certain set of rules and has them develop habits and strategies. This allows for the reversal at the finale to have much more of an impact. For architects, experience design and force perspective are challenging to maintain for multiple hours. One building does come to mind which provides prolonged 
empathetic experiences. Liebskin's Jewish Museum in Berlin jars its occupants with subtly disorienting and harsh conditions in order to simulate the toll an environment can take on a human. The color palette is reduced to mid-gray tones, forcing occupants to use light to distinguish elements. Soft shadows strain the viewer to distinguish similar elements, and harsh lights produce stressful impairment on eyes uh, by providing too much contrast. Narrow windows consistently cover the exterior, providing different level of lights through the same mechanic, that thin rectangular void. By rotating those, you've actually created a variety of conditions which can be used to do that subtle and stark thing that was messing with people's eyes. Many museums rely on layout and lighting to break up displays in an attempt to help viewers read for more than comprehension, but empathy. You're asking the visitor to learn a lot by giving them breaks between exhibits. You allow them to rebuild their stamina and learn more. These sharp corners provide an uneasy feeling throughout the entire journey, granting temporary reprieve between spaces, but not letting the visitor feel rested or have a clear path forward to the end. Liebskin treats the museum as an extension of the collection, a machine for creating feeling, not just something people move through. Inside forces a reckoning with the player is seemingly at ease. The player must use spatial and visual indicators to discern meaning about their experience, like lighting, building layout, material characteristics, and area of effect. By providing high fidelity details, the onus falls on the player to distinguish content. In Playdead's previous hit, Limbo, we see a blur as things fall out of focus. Inside, crisp backdrops indicate their value as a narrative element. There's something that's important to you. They also work to codify planes of action. Early in the game, the smaller challenges train the player to focus on opportunities presented in a single plane, while referencing mid-ground and background for information. So the scenes can actually be dissected. So in this one, we see that we have control over the chicks, and we also have control over the lever. That's in the foreground. That's lit by that lamp. As soon as we pull the lever, we lose control of the chicks as they go into the background. Poor things. The same can be said about this scene, where you have control over your player in the foreground and have a start to learn how to control the background. But they keep the plane separated as you don't have full control yet. So we're going to use that word again, phenomenology. It's when you're fed information and it stays below the level of consciousness. The subtlety of clues is actually held as a datum in this game. The player's consciousness actually fluctuates when they're tasked with challenges. Platforming challenges come in waves, switching you between survival and understanding the levels. The environment is consistently broadcasting clues to a player on a basis of whether they're in control or following along. So two different players would actually have two vastly different experiences and maybe get the same story out of it, even though they've been pre presented with the same material. So this is like a personal problem for me, but I'm not good at platforming. And this was a really hard part for me. I didn't even notice the people in the background that were watching me do this, which completely changes the scene. And then if I was even better at it, I'd have noticed that bus in the background that brought them, which indicates an institutional portion of their presence. And that would have completely changed the way I perceived that moment in the game. They also do this great thing where the materiality shifts from something seemingly less formal and rustic to something maybe a little bit more industrial, and then gets curved glass at some point, and it has a scientific look. A life cycle that a lot of technology has, from origin to militization or monetization, such as airplanes, for instance. I don't have many critiques of this game. It masters the use of passive and active design cues by fluctuating the level of attention the player has the capacity to spend outside of platforming. This provides an allegory for seeing the forest beyond the trees, which ends up being tough to simulate. So going back on that initial thought, designing for an authentic experience. 
I think it boils down to who the perceived designer is. The environment has the opportunity to feel as if it's been designed by an inhabitant of the world. Studying architecture and building taste can improve the ease at which you design for a varied context. Another way to build taste is by looking at the way directors use existing buildings as sets. Directors frame the camera and change lightings to recharacterize a space. These settings sculpt the general perception of spaces because it feels like they were built just for these moments. So the way the Bradbury building felt when you were watching Blade Runner versus 500 Days of Summer is dramatically different. And there, it has a lot to do with the closeness of the characters to the environment. It also has a lot to do with the special effects that are involved. So there's a lot of things that you can learn that aren't necessarily even in the structure of a building that can be conveyed through a variety of means. Further mastery of this medium also allows movie set designers to propose new contexts for style learned or adapted from a real built structure. So we see Frank Lloyd Wright's uh, Ennis House actually performing very well in the new uh, environment of Blade Runner in Deckard's apartment. If you do like books, I've come up with a pretty good list. The first book is uh, a good place to start if you're looking for where this line of study could take you. The next two are a lot, and it might take some rereading, but will certainly broaden your horizons. That last one is like our version of Google. It can help you find critics or authors sorted by topics. But it's nothing compared to the recommended reading that came with the original Sims game. I cherry-picked the ones that were literally part of my curriculum which is actually crucial to the Max's path to licensure in all 50 states. Thank you. And I actually provided bonus slides in case anyone asks a question that I had in another slideshow version of this. Yeah, yeah. And feel free to introduce yourself with your first name. Get to know people. Hi, I'm Steve. So uh, in reality, no design is ever truly realized. There's always some sort of socio-political pressure that, that comes in, in the construction of a building. And architectural theory rarely acknowledges this. Um, I have a background in structural or architectural engineering. And in school, I was taught that architects were the designers of buildings, when the reality is architects plus politicians plus whatever. whatever There's a lot that culture. zoning does. There's a lot that yeah. goes in there. Now, similar to this, if, if you're a level designer, you're, you're an artist, uh, you rarely have pressures beyond your own, um, your own ideas or the ideas of your art team or the ideas of your design team for how a space is going to be realized. Mm -hmm. In suggesting that we apply architectural theory to the design of a space without also um, emphasizing that we, we should consider what the realities of the construction of a space are. Uh, do you think that there's a risk that we might give people the wrong impression of how, how design is realized and, and sort of just, just be teaching them the, the, the theory um, in, in a vacuum? Or do you think that this is something that architectural theory can handle? Like, I don't know if we need like fake politicians that come in and... <laughs> and... Um, I would say that the value of virtual architecture um, maybe doesn't have to be parallel with the value of built architecture. I would say that the um, paper architects of the 70s, like, um, ha ha, you've activated one of my trap cards. <laughs> I was going to mention the metabolists, but... Levius Woods. Um, has done a lot of writing on architecture without the bounds of um, politics. And there are critics that do evaluate how politics do affect architecture, and that could be an interesting way to uh, kind of look at that. I think Half-Life actually does a pretty nice job at, at introducing that because they have the combine and the like kind of old existing architecture, and that kind of war 
is, I think, visible through the sets that they choose to create. So I think that there is kind of an interesting dialogue that can be kind of approached, but doesn't necessarily have to be. Does that answer your question? Yeah. OK. <laughs> Any other questions? All right. Sorry if this question is pretty general, but how do you go about evoking dread or unease through architecture? Hi. Like, do you have an example from the <laughs> game or in the real world? Um, yeah, I would say that things like forced perspective, height, and things that are generally from a worm's eye view, actually, um, you can do a lot to evoke dread, um, not that architects can typically do this. We are actually like under a Hippocratic oath of a type uh, to design nice spaces for people. Um, <laughs> but yeah, there are a lot of things uh, like Liebskin's work in the Jewish um, Museum in Berlin. Um, but also, yeah, memorials have a very solemn look to them. Uh, I would say dread is something that's usually evoked by camera angles, I would, I would say most actively, but uh, Gothic architecture has a good amount of it. Does that help? Yeah. Cool. Hi, I'm John. Um, sorry if you said names. Uh, I just want to say thank you. This talk is like really refreshing and articulate. Uh, Thanks. You know, one, one to throw out there. Uh, a lot of the work that I'm done, I'm interested in, is often uh, centered on kind of like the, the way that spaces manifest the things that you're talking about. And I think that, like you mentioned landscapes at one point in the talk, and I, this is such a broad topic that it's hard for me to be like, what's, what's like the way you would do this sort of thing? But I don't know if you had any suggestions for places to look for like the way that, uh, or like readings for the way, on the way that like these buildings and for example, like Breath of the Wild exist in a, a grander landscape and uh, kind of take a context from that. I know like, um, I'm, I'm from Chicago and like the uh, IIT is like mm -hmm. pretty famous architectural yeah. school, I think. And <laughs> their like school or student like commons areas like used to be a park and then they just plopped a building on top of it. And I was heard that described as postmodernist architecture but I don't know. Actually, they did maintain the sidewalks in that. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. they used the tiling of the floor to keep the same like pathways through. I would say that uh, as far as landscape goes, there's a lot that actually uh, architects have designed uh, utopian societies very often. And so maybe looking in that direction of like what is a utopian society, but also um, the way that uh, landscape architects use like um, keyholes, for instance, which is like kind of using sight lines to direct views in older gardens. Um, like, gosh, Versailles. Versailles is a really good place to kind of really delve into the depth that you can put into a garden. They had these Aesop fables like um, automatons that were powered with water um, in just a certain part of the park. So it's a very interesting thing to read about. Cool. Thank you. Um, this uh, is kind of a strange question, I guess, um, but I've, I've interacted with people who are working in all different sorts of other disciplines, artists, uh, architects, people making films, people working in the ad industry, authors, um, and most of them have absolutely no interest in video games, let alone have, have put in 300 <laughs> hours into Fallout 3. So I'm wondering if you could, I mean, you talked a lot about your background as an architect, but could you talk a little bit about your background as a gamer? Oh, um, <laughs> And what made you sure. want to come and present at a video game conference? Um, probably Doom 2. Um, <laughs> no, actually, I, I usually don't play video games with my coworkers uh, because they don't play video games. Um, no, I think that it, provo it provides a great opportunity for um, virtual spaces to have an impact on people in a way that, like you are mentioning, politics really does prevent a lot of architects from realizing a design the way they had originally intended. Or, um, of course, we are uh, kind of a patron-based um, profession, so we require someone else's money in order to realize our visions. So there's a lot of catering to the client. In fact, you've activated another one. Um, 
we fall on these crutches a lot as designers, um, which is a fair kind of, um, this is Philip Johnson's list, by the way, I can't take credit. But these are a lot of things that designers of architecture use to support themselves more than their actual designs. Um, as far as games that I like to play, I'm playing Fortnite right now. Um, <laughs> love that. And uh, gosh, I, I really put a lot of time into Risk of Rain. That's been surprisingly a great one. It's one of those ones that you can, like, again, like put your own thoughts and your imagination into because it lacks like uh, photorealistic detail, and I kind of like those ones. Does that answer everything? Great. Hi. Uh, my question comes from an art creation point of view. Uh, a lot of the time we are tasked, tasked with uh, creating a certain style of architecture or a certain kind of building, but the level design spaces that we're working with are not the same type of spaces you'd get from that style. Mm. And so when it comes to this kind of um, m you know, mashing two incompatible things together, we often end up with you know, unconvincing you know, um, Yeah, yeah, I see what you're saying. Stuff. So um, if you had any advice on how to you know, create a good style, you know, as long as it says that, you know, this is an Aztec building, even if it's not, you know, made out of uh, solid, huge stone monolithic blocks or something like that, you know, like how to, how to put a style facade or a front on a building space that doesn't necessarily suit that style of architecture. Yeah, I would say the, the most important thing you could do is frame the views in the same way, if, if that's at all possible, because like um, the Greeks had imagined the best way to view a building was, um, kind of uh, an angle of it. And so you have a, a better idea of the whole thing instead of just flat on. And so doing tricks like that could also help. But then, yeah, like you're saying, pick up individual parts that you believe have the essence of. Um, I would say materials and um, camera angles go a long way for that. But also the, the proportions of things. So if you have the opportunity to read anything about the proportions that were used, Maybe um, talking with your gray boxer about those and seeing if you can kind of meet in the middle, yeah. if that's at all possible. Yeah, there was a talk uh, sort of relating to that uh, called The Nature of Order in Game Narrative, but it was very, very architecturally based on Tuesday, I think. They had something called the 15 rules, and one of them was um, scale, of de uh, scale of detail. So, you know, from small scale to... Uh, large scale in terms of details um, was one of those rules that just uh, reminded me. So, um, yeah, I think that pretty much answers it. But um, it's, it's very ideal, you know, like uh, talking about the architecture is very sort of theoretical and mm -hmm. ideal, whereas like the actual implementation is never quite so, um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's never so cut and dry. Um, I would say also picking out something that sticks out to you in the photographs, if you see any photographs or uh, documentation of it, finding, finding a quirk in there and really committing to that, maybe embellishing it. Yeah, that's a, that's a good one. Thank you. Um, in, uh, uh, Christopher, and in video games, we don't have to necessarily live by the restrictions of physics or geometry or anything like that. If you've played Antichamber, he does a really interesting things with space that is impossible in our mind. Mm -hmm. um, and even in like dream sequences and even AAA games and other indie games, uh, there's a lot of tricks that can be done with space. Um, is there any, I guess, literature or research that's been done by architecture, even though it's not exactly applicable oh. to architecture, and how On the, the fundamental principles of... could apply to those sorts of spaces? Gosh, I know, I know there's a, okay, there was a lot of uh, research done in the 90s because people were talking about perspective as it relates to matching camera angles. Um, and there was a, gosh, I know Kipnis has talked about this. Um, he's a critic as well. Um, but there's, I'll, I'll email you. There, there are people that have talked about the warping of perspective. Um, we call it forced perspective. There is a classical uh, example of it in, oh gosh, I forget, it's been a while. Uh, but yeah, there is a classic example of um, just the set that goes back into space, but it truly doesn't. It is manipulated it in a way. So, Thank you. 
Hi, I'm Grace. I had two questions, and actually you just covered ah. one of them for the most part. Um, in terms of kind of bending that reality versus not reality, have you ever found ways where it's gone too far before, where it's a little unsettling when it's unrealistic? Oh, gosh. I, I kind of like when it's unsettling, though, because that, that means that it's trying harder to hit its character. Um, I thought Sly Cooper was really on the edge. That was one that really stuck out to me as cartoony buildings that take a, like, entesis, which is the uh, embellishment of the width of a column, to, like, the ends of what I believe to be reasonable. Uh, but that was also, like, a game that really did captivate me. I thought the, the colors that they chose and the... Um, organization of the cities actually did bring out a lot of value in the architecture that they designed. So yeah, I think that that's kind of a fun opportunity for game de developers to take, so. Since there's no one else here, can I ask the other question? Yeah. Can we see the slide again that had like the resources at the end that you oh, were yeah. recommending? Do you want the virtual version or the? <laughs> like the list one, because I was like gonna read it. Yeah, like, yeah. See it that fast. Yeah, you can see. Yeah. Yeah. This one. Yes. Oh, <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Oh, this one? Yeah. Wait, can you do both of them? Yes. These will be on the thing, though, the okay. vault. OK, that works. Oh, uh, yeah. Oh. <laughs> thank Sorry, you. I went a little bit fast, too. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> no problem. Any other questions? I probably can't help you with your foundations for your decks or houses or anything, but. <laughs> if you guys want to know about elevators, I can probably take a crack at that. <laughs> I have a question. Yeah? So just curious, your perspective, the, you know, we, mankind going out to space and gravity maybe not being a factor in the way we build things, how do you think that could possibly evolve into new forms of architecture? Oh, I think we're going to go straight back to the geodesic dome. Uh, so... Uh, Buckminster Fuller was this great guy that came up with the Damaxian um, sleep cycle even. And so he like proposed this way that you can get like two hour segments of sleep. But he was remarkable at designing these things that may not necessarily need to be architectural in the sense that they follow these classical rules. He took a more engineering approach to architecture and came up with these really great things. So I think we'll kind of go back to the 70s and kind of look at the way that architecture was designed back then before we move um, forward in another way. So yeah, like weirdo things. Um, this guy, this is kind of this, what the speculative architecture of the 70s looked like. They were, they were just like imagining what the world of the future was gonna be. And here we are, <laughs> without balloons. <laughs> Thanks. Does that, does that answer? Sort of. Okay. You guys just wanna see some cool architects? Yes, please. All right. So this guy's my favorite, Ira Saarinen. He did the TWA terminal. Uh, this is actually a real life building. It was like sculpted out of concrete. Um, I'm, surprised, I'm surprised that I haven't seen many things like this in games. Uh, it's like one, one just cohesive structure that looks like it was carved out of something, you know? Uh, this is Eric Owen Moss's Anjouant uh, project. It was speculative, but um, yeah, he kind of proposes the juxtaposition between like modern and um, Existing architecture, I think that's kind of neat. Of course, my man, Lebius Woods, uh, kind of proposing the insanity. He's actually, um, he's passed away, but he wrote a blog before he, he passed away, and it's actually really great. It's really accessible, I would say. Um, this stuff is weird. Hayduck is weird, uh, but he's great. Uh, Piranesi is actually referenced often when people talk about architecture. Uh, it's, it's just the complexity as it goes back into space is, is very compelling, uh, I would say. Uh, this guy is currently running SciArc. Uh, it's, it's kind of the way that, uh, we call it parametricism, but it's the way that we're using uh, procedural generation of elements right now. Uh, we're kind of end users to these things, so like the scales on the buildings are kind of a weird feature. Uh, Zaha's work. This is some of her newer stuff. Um, it's a mall in China. It's pretty great. Uh, she's, she was prolific. 
uh, one of, uh, actually she was the first female Pritzker Prize winner. And if you guys are looking to learn more about architects, Pritzker Prize winners are um, kind of our best bet. Uh, this is probably the most lore of architecture you can pack into a single house, Alvar Alto's uh, Villa Maria. Uh, Shigeru Ban was a master of uh, just this new architectural style that's coming to China. He's really defining a, a new look. I think it's pretty great. Gaudi, Gaudi is the best. Um, this one's uh, Casa Botlo. Uh, these are designed to look like bones, if you notice. The columns are bones. And so it's like this weird version of organic architecture. Sana has uh, these very clean spaces. So if you're trying to make something look futuristic and clean, uh, you can draw inspiration from them. They use pilotes or columns without capitals or uh, bases. Let's see. Yeah, that's, that's what I got for you. <laughs> Second smaller presentation. <laughs> Any other questions? Well, thank you guys for coming.